Okay, so next up, uh, we have Yochiro, uh, who is a postdoc under Sean Wee Fan at Stanford University. Uh, previous to that, he worked for uh, Gang Chen at MIT, uh, who has done so much seminal work uh, in thermodynamics and devices. And, um, you know, I can't even mention all the things that Gang has done. So, Yochiro is going to talk to us about fluctuation dissipation based energy and forces. And I thought it would be really um, interesting to understand more about the fluctuation dissipation um, theory and how that works and contrast that maybe to uh, what uh, Larry Ford is going to talk about after lunch. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Yochiro, for joining us and um, uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can see my screen and can hear my voice. Uh, yes, um, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so my name is Yoichiro. Uh, today I'd like to talk about the, um, the conversion between uh, radiative heat and the dispersion forces and the torques in uh, non reciprocal systems. Okay. Um, so it is well known nowadays that the radiative heat transfer between two objects significantly exceeds the black body limit when the separation between the objects is closer than around 10 micrometers around room temperature. Uh, this distance regime is called near field and the enhancement of heat transfer is due to contributions uh, from evanescent waves. Uh, so this is experimentally confirmed as shown in the left figure where they measured the radiative heat transfer between silica and the heat transfer exceeds over the black body as the separation between them uh, gets uh, smaller. Uh, similarly, when the two charged neutral bodies are in the near field, the force acts between them. Uh, so this force is generally known as dispersion force or Casimir force. The Casimir force is typically attractive force as shown in this light figure um, and acts in the direction of the separation. Uh, so these effects occur in the near field, and uh, our talk will be mainly focusing on the radiative uh, heat transfer and the momentum transfer in such a uh, distance uh, regime. Uh, so the heat transfer and the force between the objects are caused by uh, electromagnetic waves uh, due to uh, fluctuations of charges inside the object. Uh, this fluctuation is due to both quantum as well as uh, thermal fluctuations. Uh, one framework that describes the radiative heat and the momentum transfer due to fluctuating current is known as the fluctuational electrodynamics, which was originally proposed by uh, Reitel back in 1959. Uh, in this fluctuational electrodynamics, we add a fluctuation current term in the Ampere's law, which is one of the macroscopic uh, Maxwell's equations. And we consider it as a source of fluctuations inside the material. Uh, in order to know the transport quantities, such as heat transfer and the force, uh, we need to know the correlation functions of this fluctuating currents, where this S means the symmetrized correlation functions. Uh, to know this correlation function, we use the fluctuation dissipation theorem. The basic idea is that the current response to internal fluctuations, so this correlation function, uh, is the same as the current response to external perturbation, which is related to the dielectric function of the material, epsilon, as well as the temperature of the material. Uh, so by combining this uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem and these Maxwell's equations, uh, one can uh, uh, determine the radiative heat transfer and also momentum transfer uh, in the near field. Uh, so our aim is to construct a heat engine by utilizing the fluctuation induced force acting on the body as a result of heat transfer. Uh, so if we think about the two parallel plates, the typical Kachimiru force acts as an attractive force. 
in between the plates. And uh, we would need repulsive force as well if we wanted to create a cyclic motion. Uh, another way to create a sustained motion is to create a lateral force, uh, which is the force uh, parallel to the surface uh, in order to achieve a sustained motion. Uh, however, uh, one needs to break some symmetries, such as translational or rotational symmetries, to create this lateral force. And previous strategies were to use nanostructure uh, objects. Uh, recently, uh, it has been shown, uh, for instance, in this paper, that the lateral force can be created uh, in thermal non equilibrium uh, by breaking time reversal symmetry. Uh, even in systems that have translational or rotational symmetries. And the performance of such systems as a heat engine in a steady state operation where the objects are moving has not been analyzed. And this is one purpose of our study. Uh, similar to the existence of lateral force between parallel plates, uh, it was shown that the thermal radiation from a sphere that breaks the time reversal symmetry carries net angular momentum to the radiation when the sphere is in thermal non-equilibrium uh, from the environment. And as a result, the sphere rotates. So this is the conversion of radiative heat into mechanical motion of the sphere. And the performance uh, as a heat engine has been recently analyzed in this paper. Uh, also, the transfer of angular momentum between two such spheres uh, has been analyzed in this paper. Uh, for systems that consist of more than two objects, uh, which we generally call many body systems, uh, it is known that the radiative heat transfer between multiple objects that break time reversal symmetry uh, exhibits non trivial physics. However, uh, fluctuation induced force and the torque transfer in such uh, many body uh, uh, systems that break time reversal symmetry uh, has not been uh, studied. Uh, so given that interesting physics predicted in heat transfer in such systems, uh, we are interested to study uh, temporal dynamics of many body systems uh, through the uh, force and the torque transfer. Uh, so we studied force and the torque transfer in uh, many body systems when the objects are at rest and uh, this can be considered as a first wave to understand the uh, temporal dynamics. Uh, in today's talk, I'd like to uh, first discuss the fluctuation induced force and torque transfer between spheres under the static magnetic field. And uh, we show that the, a variety of motions, such as a global rotation around the center of mass, the self-propulsion, as well as a spinning around its own axis uh, can occur in thermal non-equilibrium. Uh, in the last part of my talk, uh, we also discuss our recent effort to propose a heat pump that converts the kinetic energy of carriers inside a material, such as electrons, into radiative heat uh, that flows from a cold object to a hot source, thereby uh, achieving a heat pumping. Uh, so here I show why thermal radiation from a sphere carries angular momentum when the time reversal symmetry is broken. So the left figure shows the spectrum of a thermal radiation from a indium antimonide sphere and a different magnetic field as a function of the uh, wavelengths. Uh, so when the magnetic field is zero, which corresponds to this blue line, the three dipole modes of uh, localized plasma resonance are degenerate, and we only see a single peak around uh, these wavelengths. Uh, when we apply a magnetic field to this sphere, uh, these dipole modes uh, become non-degenerate, and the single peak splits into three peaks, these three peaks, uh, where the two peaks on both sides correspond to the dipole modes that carries opposite angular momentum. So the right figure shows the pointing vector from these two uh, dipole modes that shows uh, the swarring thermal radiation uh, distribution, uh, but in the opposite direction. So it carries uh, opposite angular momentum. 
And these two moles that are situated at different wavelengths are populated different, summary populated differently. Um, therefore, the summer radiation uh, from this sphere carries a uh, angular momentum. So this is the pointing vector distribution of a thermal radiation uh, emitted from a magnetic Wilson metal, which is the material we are going to uh, discuss throughout our talk. Uh, although I do not introduce this material in detail, uh, whenever I show the arrows on top of the sphere, uh, it is equivalent to applying a magnetic field in that direction. And as you can see, the thermal radiations are swirling uh, around the uh, uh, sphere and the angular momentum is carried in the direction of this uh, magnetic field or the gyration axis, but not in the other uh, direction such as the X and the Y direction. So first it is evident that uh, no force and the torque should act on a single sphere in the environment when they are in thermal equilibrium. And so this can be seen from these figures where I show the pointing vector distributions around the sphere. Uh, the particle radiation carries the angular momentum to the environment, but that angular momentum is exactly canceled by the uh, angular momentum due to the environment radiation. So in thermal equilibrium, no net act should act on the sphere and therefore the sphere does not rotate or experience any forces. Uh, so in the following, we will mainly consider the thermal uh, non-equilibrium uh, situations. The intuitive argument uh, on why a sphere experiences a lateral force is as follows. The left figure shows the gray sphere in the vicinity of the blue sphere that radiates the thermal radiation with non-angular, non-zero angular momentum because of the uh, existence of the non-zero magnetization out of the screen. Uh, so the pointing uh, vector around the gray sphere shows uh, here at the bottom figure, uh, shows that uh, the, uh, we should expect a um, force acting not only in the Y direction, which is the separation direction, uh, but also in the uh, y direction due to the radiation pressure. Uh, however, if we turn off this magnetization, then the thermal radiation from this blue sphere uh, radially uh, goes outwards, but it does not show any uh, angular momentum. Uh, in this case, we do not expect a lateral force acting on the gray sphere. Uh, so this is the intuitive argument as to why the force should experience a lateral force. Uh, so in the following, we developed the formalism to exactly calculate the force and the torque and uh, confirmed these uh, intuitive arguments. Uh, so the formalism that we have developed is based on the um, uh, fluctuational electrodynamics uh, uh, formalism. And the way we compute the force as well as the torque is by uh, determining the Maxwell's stress tensor and also the angular momentum flux. And we integrate over the surface of the sphere of interest. And in order to compute those Maxwell's stress tensor and angular momentum flux, uh, we needed to determine the total electromagnetic field around the sphere that includes all the possible uh, scattering events that can happen uh, in the system that uh, in general contains uh, multiple uh, uh, spheres. And so to determine that, we use the uh, scattering uh, formalisms uh, based on the previous work uh, that has uh, 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 developed this formalism uh, extensively. So our formalism is the exact in the framework of the fluctuational electrodynamics and it is analytical. So uh, it can be uh, computed relatively fast and is also applicable to arbitrary number of spheres and arbitrary uh, dielectric uh, functions of the sphere. So as, a, as an example of thermal non-equilibrium situations, we consider two spheres uh, under the same magnetization direction and at the same temperature at 300 Kelvin, uh, but there's a thermal non-equilibrium from the environment. Uh, so it is well known that the uh, radiative heat transfer uh, uh, 
so, so I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, on the left figure shows the uh, radiative heat uh, transfer between the uh, two spheres, which is the uh, blue line, as well as the, uh, from the sphere to the environment, which is this uh, uh, red line. Uh, because the uh, distance is relatively far, most radiation goes to the environment, and therefore the total radiation and the radiation to the environment uh, almost overlaps. And as you can see, we can see several peaks, and this peak here corresponds to the uh, M equal uh, uh, zero mode, where uh, this peak all, uh, always exists, even if we turn off the magnetization. And uh, as we apply the magnetization, these peaks will split into both the lower frequency as well as the higher frequency part, and uh, we see the similar peaks. On the right figure, we show the force acting on the sphere two in the y direction. And as I explained in the intuitive argument, if we consider uh, the case where if we don't apply the magnetic field, there shouldn't be any lateral force. However, if we apply the magnetic uh, magnetization, uh, then the lateral force uh, exists. So this figure on the right shows a different contributions on the lateral force acting on the sphere two. And uh, the contribution mostly uh, comes from the um, radiation due to the emission, its own emission. So the emission from the sphere two, we're experiencing the scattering and will act back on the sphere itself. And as you can see, these peaks uh, corresponds to these peaks that we see in the radiation spectrum. And these peaks uh, actually uh, corresponds uh, to uh, 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 that uh, also carries the uh, angular uh, momentum that I will show in the next slide. So from the symmetry, in this case, the temperature is the same, the material is the same. So this system has the inversion symmetry. Uh, so if the force acting on the sphere two is in the minus y direction, then the same amount of lateral force will act on the sphere one, but, but in the opposite direction. And therefore, these two spheres will start to rotate around the uh, center of mass of this system. And not only that, uh, because the angular momentum transfer occurs in thermal non-equilibrium, these two spheres will also start to rotate around its own axis. And uh, the direction of the uh, uh, spinning is the same, again, due to the uh, inversion uh, uh, symmetry of this uh, system. And uh, here on the right figure, I showed the torque as a function of the spectrum acting on the sphere two. And as you can see, it's clearly non-zero and therefore the, um, uh, these two spheres uh, will uh, start uh, spinning uh, in thermal non-equilibrium. Uh, now, the lateral force is purely due to thermal contributions but the force uh, can also act due to the uh, vacuum fluctuations, but it only acts in the X directions. So here on the left figure, I show the force in the X direction as a function of the distance in some are non-equilibrium situations. And as you can see in the uh, separation, when the separation is uh, small, this uh, vacuum fluctuation contribution or the usual Casimir force dominates over the contribution from the thermal radiation. And so when the separation between the two spheres is close, the force is attractive. And when the separation between the four uh, spheres uh, is large, then the thermal contribution over, uh, uh, dominates over the vacuum contribution and the force becomes a repulsive. And on the right figure, I show the uh, uh, lateral force, which is solely due to the thermal Casimir force as a function of the separations. And throughout the distance regime that we studied, this direction of the lateral force uh, does not change. Uh, we can also think about changing the direction of the magnetization. Uh, in particular, that material we consider the magnetic quartz metal is a ferromagnetic material. So this can be achieved by uh, flipping the direction of the sphere. So if we think about the case where the magnetization direction is the anti-parallel, then this system now has the uh, mirror symmetry because uh, across this center plane, 
uh, if we flip the, if, if we uh, operate the mirror uh, reflection, the direction of the magnetization is uh, flipped. And therefore, in this case, if the lateral force exists in one direction, then the lateral force on the other sphere has to also act in the same direction. So in this case, these two spheres uh, does not experience a global rotation, but it will experience, uh, experience a self-propulsion in the same direction. And this, the direction of the self-propagation uh, propulsion can change uh, as a function of the uh, distance um, due to the, um, the changing interactions of the electromagnetic uh, modes between the spheres as a function of the distance. Uh, so this motion is actually related to the torque uh, transfer between the two spheres. So if we look at the torque transfer between the two spheres, uh, then because of the symmetry, the torque acting on the sphere two is the opposite to the torque acting on the sphere one. So in this case, whether the system is in summer equilibrium or non-equilibrium, the total torque exchanged between the two spheres and the, and the environment has to be zero. There shouldn't be any net transfer of angular momentum. Uh, this we uh, uh, rigorously calculated the transfer of torque acting on the two spheres. And as you can see, the torque acting on the sphere one exactly cancels uh, with the torque acting on the sphere two. Uh, because there is no torque transfer to the environment, the motion of the two spheres shouldn't also have any angular momentum. So the self-propulsion uh, does not uh, have any angular uh, momentum. So uh, these two uh, uh, results make sense. Uh, so I mentioned that the lateral Kashmir force is solely due to thermal contributions. Uh, however, the lateral force uh, can also act even in global thermal equilibrium. Uh, so one question that we asked is that uh, we, we can consider different orientations of the magnetizations in the spheres, but which configuration is most stable? So we studied the Kashmir energy for different uh, orientations of the magnetizations for both parallel and anti-parallel case at the global uh, equilibrium at zero Kelvin. And we found that the most config uh, stable configuration is when the magnetization is parallel and the direction is perpendicular to the separation directions. So what it means is that if we think about the two spheres, such as this, even in global thermal equilibrium, the lateral Kashmir force will act in this direction so that this particle will be pushed back towards these positions, which has the lowest uh, Kashmir energy. Uh, so as a representative uh, case of a many body systems, we consider three spheres on the vertices of the equilateral triangle. And uh, there's a very interesting work from a Professor Shanghui Huan's group that uh, if we think about three systems on the magnetic field, uh, the uh, thermal radiation between each sphere and the environment uh, is equal, meaning that there is no net heat flux between the environment and the spheres. But when we look at the radiative heat transfer between the spheres, uh, the, the, uh, the amount heat from the sphere one to two is not necessarily equal to the heat from two to one. And therefore, even in global thermal equilibrium, it can be a heat flow that flows in one direction among the spheres. Uh, so this is called a persistent heat current, and this is a purely uh, many body uh, uh, effects. Here on the left figure, I show the heat flux as a function of the spectrum for the two directions. And as you can see, these two uh, can be uh, different. And therefore, there is a net heat transfer uh, circulating around these uh, three spheres. Uh, in their work, they proposed that the uh, one way to measure this one is to consider thermal non-equilibrium situations. So if we think about the case where the sphere one is at the higher temperature compared to the two, sphere two and the sphere three, the heat will be preferentially flow from one to two rather than one to three. And therefore the sphere two will heat up faster than the temperature of the sphere three. And so 
this is an interesting system. And we also looked at the force transfer and the torque transfer in this system. And uh, so here uh, I showed the uh, uh, torque uh, acting on the uh, sphere one, sorry, sphere uh, two due to the thermal radiation from a sphere one and also the torque acting on the sphere one due to the sphere two. So we are looking at the torque transfer between the sphere one and the two. And as you can see at the frequencies where the heat flux uh, becomes different, the angular uh, momentum or the torque transfer uh, also uh, becomes different. So uh, this indicates that uh, the existence of the persistent heat flow also uh, indicates the existence of the persistent angular momentum uh, between the uh, uh, three spheres. So similarly to their proposal, uh, if we think about the thermal non-equilibrium situations where the sphere one, for instance, is at a higher temperature than the sphere two and three, because of this imbalance of the uh, angular momentum flux, the sphere two will start to rotate faster than the sphere three. And that may actually uh, be uh, used to indicate the existence of the persistent flow of uh, heat as well as the uh, angular momentum. So similar to two sphere case, we also looked at the thermal non-equilibrium situations uh, where the temperature of the spheres are 300 Kelvin, but the environment is at zero Kelvin. Uh, so we know that in this case, there is the uh, net angular trans uh, momentum transfer to the environment. And as a result, there is the uh, lateral force acting in the X directions, as well as the uh, net torque acting on the each sphere. And so these two, three spheres will start to rotate globally as well as the spin around its own uh, axis, as we uh, discussed in the uh, two-sphere case. Uh, finally, uh, we also looked at the uh, stability of the different configurations of the uh, magnetization directions in the three spheres and uh, computed the Casimir energy uh, to determine the most uh, stable uh, configuration. So these three lead lines corresponds to the three top uh, cases where the magnetizations are in the plane of the triangle. And in this case, the Kashmir energy varies little, which means that uh, different configurations uh, can be taken if we apply a, a, a small perturbation. Uh, what we found is that the, similar to the two body case, the most stable configuration is here, which means that the, when the magnetization direction is all parallel and perpendicular, to the uh, plane of the uh, triangle. So we studied the uh, force and torque transfer among the uh, two and the three uh, spheres at the rest. And so uh, our current work is to study the uh, temporal uh, dynamics uh, in this uh, system. Um, so in the first part, we consider the force and the torque transfer between uh, multiple nanoscale objects. Uh, while these are fundamentally interesting, uh, it will not be practically useful as a heat engine. Uh, practical heat engines needs to be extensive and therefore uh, planar device configuration is uh, desirable. So for this purpose, we consider two parallel plates where the external work is applied to a one of the objects, uh, particularly in this case, a colder object. And we discussed that the radiative heat transfer between the two slabs flows from a cold object to a hot object, thereby uh, achieving a heat pump. Um, so the physical mechanism of uh, achieving a heat pumping is as follows. Uh, so if we consider a situation where a body two, which is at the lower temperature, is moving at the velocity with respect to the body B. Um, we consider the heat flux from body two to body one at the frequency omega prime measured from the observer that moves with this body two. Let's say this is the omega prime. This wave, if we look at from the uh, observer that is with body one, which is at rest, then this wave is coming towards this observer at the velocity V. 
And because of the Doppler shift, this frequency omega prime will increase from this observer's point of view. And that relation is given by the Lorentz transformation. So the energy or the frequency uh, of the radiation uh, is increased by the Lorentz transformation, while the number of photons emitted from this body two should not change, whether you see from the body two's observer or body one's observer. And therefore the number of the uh, photons will be evaluated at the uh, frequency omega prime. So the heat flux from body two to body one is proportional to the product of the H bar nu times the number of photons. And the classical, if we take just the classical limit where this exponential term is much greater than one, then you can see that the emission is exponentially enhanced by this factor, which is proportional to the QX, which is the uh, wave number in this direction of the motion times the velocity. So the heat flux from body two to body one is uh, exponentially amplified. Now, if you look at the opposite direction, then the heat flux is exponentially suppressed because from this observer's point of view, now the wave is, is going away by the velocity of this body two. And therefore the Lorentz transformation of the frequency, the uh, frequency of the light for the observer on body one will be decreased compared to omega prime. So uh, by following the same argument, in this case, the radiation is exponentially suppressed. So if we can create a system that has a preferentially, uh, that, that supports the electromagnetic wave that preferentially propagates in the right direction, but not to the left direction, then we can exponentially amplify the heat flux from the body two to body one. And when this is sufficient, even when the temperature of body two is lower than the temperature of body one, we can create a net heat flow from body two to body one. So we developed the uh, uh, fluctuation dissipation framework to calculate this. And we first consider the case uh, where the two bodies are in zoom antimonide. And we create the temperature difference of the one degree and the separation is the 10 nanometer. So this is in the near field. And we apply the magnetic field and we uh, move this uh, body two at the velocity of 10 to the four meter per second. On the right figure, I show the heat flux from the body one to two as a function of the velocity. So when the velocity is small, the heat flux, which is this blue line, which corresponds to the left axis uh, is negative. This is understandable because uh, heat flow should be from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. However, as you increase the velocity, then the direction of the heat flow starts to uh, decrease. And then when the velocity is sufficiently high, uh, the direction actually flips. So from this calculation, we found that the velocity that, we that is required is on the order of uh, 10 to the three or 10 to the four. Uh, so the question is, how do we achieve such a high velocity? Uh, so interestingly, uh, experiments suggest that uh, instead of moving the material, if we apply a uh, bias in the material and uh, electrons will flow inside the material through the uh, static ionic background, uh, this moving electrons can assimilate the moving body. And so if we apply this, then instead of moving the entire body, we can apply an electric bias to the material and then let the electrons flow. And this elect flowing electron will function the same as the moving body. And for this purpose, we found that the graphene is particularly interesting because the drifting uh, velocity of uh, massless Jack fermions can be as high as a uh, uh, 0.1 uh, of the Fermi velocity, which is the 10 to the five meter per second. Also, graphene has a weak phonon-mediated radiative heat transfer, which usually is, uh, uh, gives an adverse effect to achieve cooling. So as a prototypical system, we considered two suspended graphene sheets at the two different temperature, where the one graphene sheet is at 300 Kelvin, the other graphene sheet is uh, five degrees higher than this graphene sheet. 
the separation is 10 nanometer. And we considered a reasonable uh, drift velocity of Dirac fermions inside the uh, graphene sheet, which is the 0.3 times the Fermi velocity. And what we found is that in this case, the net heat flow flows from a lower temperature to a higher temperature, thereby achieving a, 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 a heat pump. And here I show the heat flux from the body one, sorry, the lower graphene to the higher graphene as a function of the velocity. And as you can see, as the velocity increases, the heat flow direction uh, flips, uh, which means the cooling. Uh, the required work to flow these uh, electrons or the Dirac fermions inside the graphene can be estimated uh, by calculating the drag force acting on these uh, electrons, uh, which is given by, uh, which is shown in this figure, times the velocity. Uh, on the lower light figure, I show the coefficient of performance uh, of this uh, system. And as you can see, when the velocity exceeds, for instance, 0.4 of the Fermi velocity, the coefficient of performance can exceed one, uh, which means that uh, we can achieve a uh, net cooling. Uh, so we studied the thermodynamic efficiency of this system as a heat engine. So in this case, we consider the body one is at the higher temperature than the body two. So the heat flow is body one to two. And uh, we assume that there is a force acting on the body two that is moving at the velocity B. And in this case, by using the fluctuation, this uh, electrodynamics framework that we, we developed, if we define a uh, thermodynamic efficiency by the ratio of the work on the body two divided by the heat flux, then we can prove that this efficiency bounded by uh, this expression here, which is the Carnot efficiency, but we have this gamma term, which is a Lorentz transformation factor here. So this uh, can be understood that uh, this efficiency, all the quantities are defined in terms of the observer that is with body one. So the body two is moving and therefore the body two, the moving body uh, looks colder by a factor over one, by a factor uh, one over gamma. And this, uh, uh, the, uh, tr the temperature transformation coincides with the uh, Planck-Einstein uh, theory. So we showed that the efficiency is bounded by this expression, uh, but the, uh, practically, how do we achieve this one? And so we identified four uh, conditions to achieve that. The first is that uh, we consider the system that is mirror symmetric across the XZ plane, which assures that the force in the Y direction in the perpendicular to this screen is zero. And also heat transfer occurs monochromatically at single frequency. We also want to eliminate any waves that has a non-zero wave number in the Y direction because these waves will contribute to heat transfer but does not contribute to creating a force. Also, if we can create a system that supports electromagnetic waves that pro predominantly propagates in the positive X direction but not in the minus X direction, uh, which may be possible by uh, using the non-reciprocity, then we showed that the efficiency of the system approaches the, the ratio of the uh, QX times V divided by omega zero. And we also can show that this efficiency uh, reaches the uh, uh, Carnot efficiency. So by uh, designing the system, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, enhance the efficiency of this system. And the efficiency of the heat pump uh, is the inverse of this uh, uh, Carnot efficiency. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for your time today. And uh, uh, I'd like to finish uh, my talk. I think I'm a little bit over. I apologize for that. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Yochiro. Very interesting new results on the dynamics between multiple particles and the non-equilibrium fluctuation forces. And then also on the cooling that you can achieve between moving objects and be interesting to know really does a you know the electrons moving without the lattice moving you know does that is it really something moving or is it just an effective motion 
Uh, and I guess that uh, that paper that was published in Nature is pretty, they feel pretty strongly that that is the case. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I, yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other question I had was um, on your next to last slide about the Carnot efficiency. And you use the, the Planck and Einstein notion that uh, object in motion is cooler, but of course that's a uh, debate, right? Um, people have, that's an ongoing debate for the past hundred years and people have thought that, well, no, it gets hotter or it stays the same. So there's, uh, you know, whether the, the gamma is in the, the alpha, whether it's in the numerator or de denominator or not needed at all is in question. So why did you choose the, um, the Planck-Einstein approach? Yes, um, so I guess I should, how to say, explain a little bit more carefully this one. Uh, I did not choose the uh, Planck-Einstein theory. Um, so, it, so, so this gamma factor, uh, really comes from the Lorentz transformation of the electromagnetic waves, whether you see in the core moving frame or in the rest frame. Now, this result, the reason why the gamma factor appears here is because we define the thermodynamic efficiency in this way. But I, 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 I write down our definition of thermodynamic efficiency. So in fact, uh, the, um, there's a paper by Landsberg that says that uh, you cannot define the thermodynamic efficiency by this expression uh, in deep uh, uh, relativistic limit, uh, because uh, uh, this does not include the two uh, contributions in the work. One contribution is that uh, the heat transfer to the body two will change the momentum of the body two. And therefore, uh, there's a part of uh, work that cannot be extracted. In, in that process. Also, when we set up this heat engine, we already assume that the body two is moving at the velocity V. And so part of the kinetic energy is converted in the work. So that part is also cannot be used. And so when we consider these two effects as a work that cannot be utilized, then we have to redefine this efficiency. And we actually uh, uh, studied that as well. And if we use that efficiency, then the efficiency is bounded by the usual karma efficiency, one over T2 over T1. Um, so this gamma factor really appears because we defined efficiency in this way, uh, but uh, this definition uh, may not be strictly speaking uh, correct in the, uh, uh, when the body is moving at the relativistic velocity. So uh, that's my comment. I see. So therefore your result uh, does not do anything to resolve that controversy about the temperature of a moving body and it's based on your definition of the thermodynamic efficiency right so we do not transform temperature uh, we do not do the Lorentz transform of temperature what we do is the Lorentz tr transformation of the electromagnetic waves in the core moving frame or the rest frame and this right. Lorentz transformation is well known the temperature of the body two and body one are always evaluated in the core moving frame. So it's a proper temperature. Right, so that way you don't have to deal with the controversy uh, right. at all. <laughs> right, okay, well, thank you very much. And um, I, think, uh, um, I think we should move on next is, because next is lunch. And after lunch, uh, Professor Ford is gonna give us a talk and he has a very tight schedule. So we're going to start exactly at two o'clock after uh, after lunch today. So thank you once again, Yochiro. Appreciate your presentation and your work of uh, some very exciting results. And uh, so thank we'll see. Much. Yeah, we'll see see everyone back at two o'clock Eastern time.